Welcome to COC. Super glad that you're here today. Um, and super glad uh, to celebrate today once the Patriots lose. Amen. Yeah. All right. If you're a guest of ours today, thank you again. Please take time to fill out that guest uh, communication card that's in your programs. We would love to just get a little bit of information about you so we can pray for you. You can drop those off at any bends at our, uh, also any of these type of bends that are floating around here or at our uh, uh, new here, start here tent. We'd love to, to get information for you. We are heading into the last week of a series that we started at the beginning of the year called Dangerous Prayers. Dangerous Prayers. And uh, Pastor Matt... Uh, our executive pastor started us off and did a tremendous job that first week with a dangerous prayer that uh, you could pray. Now, you got to remember, you got to be careful. This is why we title it Dangerous Prayers, because they're dangerous. If you actually really, really pray these prayers and mean it, something dangerous could happen to your life. Something dangerous meaning very uncomfortable to what you are accustomed to in your life. So that first week, he, he said the very first dangerous prayer was centered around praying, search me. God, would you search me? Would you know my heart? Would you test me and know all of my anxious thoughts? And he did, he, he did a tremendous job uh, with that first week. And then last week, I share with you what I believe of the three is the most dangerous prayer that you could pray in your life. And that prayer is the prayer of break me. Uh, it kind of sounds something like this. God, would, would you break me, break my body, break, break my will, break my, my sin, break my spirit, break me of me. And I want to wholeheartedly serve and follow you with all of my life. So, so break me. I completely and totally surrender to you and I pour myself out to you. And uh, that's where we started with the first two, search me and break me. So today I want to share with you the third dangerous prayer that you could pray and something might change in your life dramatically for the good. And that third dangerous prayer is uh, called send me. See, if you, if you allow God to search you and then move a step towards breaking you, then you are now available to do whatever God wants to do with you in your life. And chances are when that happens, he is going to send you. Now, when I say this, we get a little nervous, don't we? Because we're like, hey, listen, I can get to search me. I can even break some. But when I say send me, is he going to send me <laughs> to Africa, <laughs> to the Philippines, right? Is he going to send me literally somewhere to where, you know, it's completely foreign to me and I'm unfamiliar? And, and is this going to dramatically change my life? And the, and the answer is yes. You're going to go to Africa. No, no, listen. The, the answer is yes. He's going to open your eyes and help you understand that you are a sent one. As a follower and believer in Jesus Christ, those should be prayers that are on your heart every single day of your life. God, search me today. Break me today. Send me today. Because your Africa, your Philippines, where your, 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 your South Korea, your, your Japan, wherever it is, literally for you, it is your own backyard. It is your neighborhood. And I kind of came on a little strong last week um, to where we are called to go and tell people about Jesus. Our, our primary mission uh, philosophy or COC is to gather, to grow, to give. And then the natural byproduct is to go. And if you are not going, I'm sorry to say this, but you are a disobedient disciple of Christ. You are, so, so, so you can ask yourself, how obedient am I by doing this? When is the last time that you invited somebody to come to church? Yeah, it's getting quiet in here. I need to move on and just kind of break, break it a little bit. Send me. I am available to be used by you wherever you want. Send me. Now, to actually be able to pray that prayer right there, send me, you need to know kind of what it really takes to becoming completely in tune 
with God's will for your life. Because you'll never be able to pray, send me, if you don't know what God's will is for your life or you're not following God's will for your life. So what I want to do today is kind of share with you a little bit of how it is that God gets your attention and to make sure that you are paying attention when he is getting your attention. Can I get an amen on that one? All right, because that is the only way that you will become aware and become completely available to be used by him. And it deals primarily with understanding your identity with him. All throughout the scriptures, you will find many, many calls from God upon his servants. Many calls. And you'll find a consistent theme with all of them. And they're not like one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. But you'll find three particular responses to the call of God in your life. And, and when I share these with you real briefly, you will probably think, you know what? I maybe have answered one of those ways a few times in my life. So for example, j just to share with you the three responses with Jonah. Everybody knows Jonah, right? Jonah and the big fish that swallowed him a whole. Can I get an amen on that one, all right? You know who I'm talking about. I'm trying to use some, some, Ill, uh, some, some people that you may be familiar with. When Jonah, with Jonah, when God called him, here's what his response was. Here I am, I'm not going. <laughs> right? Point to somebody that has said that. No, don't do that right now. Jonah. Jonah's response to the call of God is, here I am, I hear you, but I'm not going. And then we have Moses. Moses, and we know Moses, right, from Prince of Egypt, right? You know, like the, right, you know what I'm talking about, right? Moses basically said this, here I am, send somebody else. Right? You, you, you know this. You know somebody that has answered this way, or maybe you have answered it. I hear your call on my life, God but send somebody else. But then there's somebody that's unique and we're gonna share his story today that said something completely different, but it took some doing, it, it took some awareness of who he was and that guy's name is Isaiah. He was a prophet in the Old Testament and God called Isaiah and Isaiah said this, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. So you have the three different responses to God's call in your life. You got Jonah who said, hey, I hear you, but I'm not going. You got Moses who said, I can hear you too, God. Why don't you send somebody else? But Isaiah, Isaiah, and I think you're going to find it unique to his story. Isaiah realized, I cannot not go because of what God has done for me. The first two, if you look at them really closely, the first two deal with who? You. They deal with you. That's why I said this is a matter of perspective. They deal with what you want in your life or what you don't want in your life. But the last one is a complete and total yielding, a surrendering of somebody that has been searched, of somebody that has been broken, and somebody that is willing to say, send me. Send me me. So to, to ever, ever be able to pray the prayer, the dangerous prayer of, of send me, it takes you and me sometimes a little time. So I want to talk about Isaiah today. And I want to hopefully lead some of you to maybe being able to come close to the edge or even across the edge to being able to ultimately pray the send me dangerous prayer. Here I am, God. I am available. You have, listen, you have my permission to interrupt me and my life. If you want me to go somewhere, I'll go. If you want me to stay, I'll stay. If you want me to say something, I'll speak. If you want me to simply be quiet and pray, I'll pray. If you want to use my time, my talents, and my treasures, they're yours. Whatever it is, God, here am I. I'm completely available as your servant. Send me. That's the prayer. That's the prayer. Now you're kind of probably knowing why we've called this series Dangerous Prayers, right? Because you're like, whoo, that's a serious prayer. That could actually, if God answers, could change the trajectory of my life. 
Now, when it comes to this particular prayer, send me. You really need to understand that it primarily deals with your and my understanding of what the word holiness is all about. You can look it up in the Bible for definition's sake uh, or, or in the dictionary, but holiness basically means being set apart, being different, being noticeably different from this world. And that's a great segue into our next week's series that we start called Aliens. I am so excited about that series. You've got to come back. Every year we do a generosity emphasis series. And you were thinking, how would you draw money and generosity from aliens? Just come back and see. Just come back and see. I'm super excited about it. But you are different. You are noticeably different. And that means this holiness actually starts to become your identity. It must become your identity if you ever want to become available to be used and sent by God. So it all starts here. If you're a note taker, you might want to write this down. It all starts with understanding holiness. It all starts here with your attention. With your attention. Do I have your attention? Okay, see, we're already going to struggle today. Because some of you, I, I, I can't even get your attention. How can God get your attention, right? It all starts with attention. Hey, let me ask you a question. You ever got your attention gotten? Right? You ever got, I'll bet you I can get your attention gotten if I pulled you up on stage to help you share the rest of this message with me. Right? You ever got your, and everybody's piping in now. I see how you are. A little threat never hurts anything, right? In Isaiah chapter 6, God got the prophet Isaiah's attention. Let me kind of set the stage for you. The setting is sometime after the death of King Uzziah. Most of Uzziah's story can be found in 2 Chronicles chapter 26. You can go read there later if you'd like. All of this stuff is in your Bible app, by the way. It's in your Bible app. The Bible app's cool, is it not? Is it not cool? Yeah, I've got some people that got it. Some of you are like, I ain't doing that. I got a flip phone. Some of our well-seasoned friends, I got a jitterbug. <laughs> right? Bible app's really cool. Ginger's got one too for C-City. You should check it out. All right, so, so get this because most of these notes are in there. But for the most part, just to give you a little background, King Uzziah was a successful king. We, we do know that Isaiah, the prophet, Isaiah ministered during part of King Uzziah's reign. So we know they had some sort of a relationship with one another, leaving room for us to kind of, you know, basically draw the conclusion that they were somewhat friends. They knew each other, okay? So, so we can speculate uh, on the state of mind uh, for Isaiah when he received this vision in chapter 6. And it's because, it's because death or tragedy can often change the way you think. Death or tragedy can often change the way you think. Now, real quick, we'll, we'll come back uh, to this in a minute. But there's two important things I want you to get. Let me read the first verse first. In the, fir- in the year that King Uzziah died... This is Isaiah writing. He said, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Now, you, real quick, Isaiah chapter 6 is the prophet Isaiah sharing with us a vision of God. All right? In Scripture, we see similarities, we see comparisons, we, par- we see parallels to the kingdom of heaven. We see some ideas and some glimpses of, of who God is. But there is no real passage in Scripture outside of Isaiah 6 that gives you very clear distinction of how magnificent God is. And that's what Isaiah chapter 6 is all about. So real quick, Isaiah has a tragedy in his life. That tragedy is King Uzziah died. And what do we see that happens? The tragedy causes Isaiah to go to the temple. And I just got to highlight this really quick because whatever you might go through, whatever tragedy it is, however big, however small it might be, notice the response of the prophet Isaiah because it is so accurate of what you should do because tragedy can often affect your availability. The tragedy that happened to him in his life, King Uzziah dying, drove him to God, not from God. I'm going to say that again because I think it deserves a little more 
outburst on your part. Whatever tragedy you may be facing, that tragedy was allowed into your life for a specific reason, to get your attention. And you will never get your attention gotten and become available if you don't understand that tragedy was allowed into your life for a reason. So it should drive you to God, not from God. Okay? Tragedy is very often something that God will use to get our attention for availability. Because let's face it, a lot of times when tragedy comes, we drift. We drift. We often, we often turn from being human beings in that tragedy to becoming human doings in that tragedy. And we drift and we stop paying attention. Sometimes, don't miss this, if we don't have some sort of shakeup in our lives, we often find ourselves in a temporary breakup with God in our lives. I'm going to say that again. Because everybody here has been here before. You have had a tragedy. You have had a crisis. You have had a moment in which you're wondering, why God? You know what why God leads to? Why me? Why me? And if you don't wake up and realize that 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 tragedy, that crisis was allowed, it was allowed into your life by God, you will break up with God. We disappear. We leave. And I'm telling you this. I'm, I, just, I got 22 years in this thing. And I've seen this happen to countless people time and time again. When a shakeup comes, a breakup is coming next for the majority. For the majority. So tragedy wakes us up. So I want to ask you this. Because... When God allows something in your life to get your attention, it's about him wanting your availability. Wanting him to know how available are you to me? How available are you to be willing to to actually pray a prayer of send me, I'm available. So let me ask you this question today. You can think about it, all right, throughout, throughout the morning. If God doesn't have your attention or your availability right now, what's it gonna take for God to get your attention? What is it going to take for God to finally get your attention? And some of you, gosh, my heart and my prayers go out to you, but we are so strong-willed, we are so determined, and time and time again, God brings something into our life or he allows it to come in and we will not move. We will not budge. This is my life, not your life. Did you know that every time you get a spanking from God, it gets harder and harder and harder. You've got to wake up and allow God. So what's it gonna take for God to get your attention? For some of us here today, we think what we're going through right now, it's tragic. But if we don't repent from whatever it is that God wants us to be aware of in that moment, it's only gonna get a lot worse. So what's it gonna take? What's it gonna take? For God to give your attention. That's the first and foremost. My point is this. Tragedies have significance. You remember tragedies in your life, don't you? You remember heartbreaking moments where something happened, God allowed something in your life. And it's not always bad. I'm not saying that. But something has been allowed into your life and you remember that. Why is that the case? So you can recollect and you can recall the next time that you go through another tragedy of how God was good and faithful in that moment. Let me, let, me, let me give you an illustration of what I mean by we remember tragedies. How many of you are old enough, all right, to remember when, when, when President John F. Kennedy was shot? Raise your hand. You remember when and where it was. Okay, good. I just want to make sure I'm including everybody because I was not alive then. Okay? <laughs> but these next few, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not hard on you, seriously. How many of you can remember when and where you were when the Challenger exploded? Right? How many of you can remember when and where you were on 9-11? How many of you can remember when the first Persian Gulf War took place? (laughs) You know what's crazy about that? It's kind of the first war in my lifetime and we watched the war on television. But we remember... 
when tragedies happen, when crises happen in our life, big moments we remember because tragedy shakes us up. It gets our attention, which often leads to our availability. Tragedy is what God often uses in your life to remind you that you are not in control. That is what it does. So my suggestion for you today, if you have been doing this in the past, would be this. The next crisis, the next tragedy, the next heartache in your life that God allows, don't waste the hurt. Don't waste the tragedy. Use it for his glory. Let him get your attention. What's it going to take for God to get your attention? So you can ultimately become available and pray. Send me. Send me. The second word today. First was attention. The second one is this. Accuracy. Accuracy. God often gets our attention so we can see him accurately. Okay? This is why God is allowing this in your life. He wants to get your attention and then he wants you to draw your eyes upon him. Remember, Isaiah ran to God, not from God. He wants you now to see him accurately. The problem today is this, is the world's perception towards Jesus, in my opinion, is completely and totally inaccurate. The world's perception and culture today uh, uh, towards Jesus is completely inaccurate towards God. And ju just so happens, in my opinion, Christians are a big reason why. Point to somebody and say, you're wrong. You're why. Let me explain to you. Cheesy illustration, but let me explain to you. All right? Christian bumper stickers. You ever seen this one? God's my co-pilot. That's a problem, friends. That's a big problem. You know why? Because Jesus didn't die on a cross so he could go on a ride with you. He, he died on a cross so he could drive you. Here's this one, ready? In case of rapture, this car will be unmanned. <laughs> I, I literally have seen these bumper stickers. Some of you may have them and you'll be getting them off of your car later today, won't you? <laughs> I have literally followed cars with these bumper stickers and in particular case with the second one, following a car there, I, I kid you not, I've seen this bumper sticker a lot in my life and I follow the car and I have yet, I have yet, I have yet seen somebody pull off to the side of the road, get on their knees before Jesus and ask Jesus Christ to become their Lord and Savior. I, 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 you're, you're sending a message to other people that think like you, but you're supposed to reach those that aren't like you. How about this one? Church signs. Oh, these are good. Church signs. Um, check out this first one. If you don't know who Jesus is, you're the biggest loser. Credit to trying to be relevant, but that's just not a way to send a positive message of Jesus Christ giving his life to somebody so you could have a relationship with him. Ne you know what? Next time you share Christ with somebody... Tell them they're a loser first. See how it goes for you. How about this one? Ready? What is missing in CH dash CH? You are. It's cute. It's clever, but it's interesting. And then this one, I've, I've seen this one be before. This is awesome. Check this. Uh, you may party in hell, but you'll be the barbecue. Are you kidding me? 
I could spend the next two and a half hours just sharing these bumper stickers, these church signs, these t-shirts for you. And they're all being brought to this world who is lost and in need of a savior from Christians. No wonder, no wonder people don't want anything to do with God. Because, the, because now look, I'm not saying that it's, that, that it's you, if you have the bumper sticker, that's really bad, but you didn't take it off. But it, l- listen, this is, this is what the world thinks of us. This really is. So, so whether or not you do it or not, or have partaken in it or not, or gone to a church that, what, whatever, listen, listen. This is something you are always going to have to face. You, you are facing an uphill battle when trying to reach people for Christ. Because you're facing this obstacle out of the gate. The world's view towards significance, which is only found in Jesus Christ, right, is totally and completely inaccurate. And Christians are a big reasons why. Oftentimes, other Christians in your life are a huge reason why you are not as available as God wants you to be in your own life. Oftentimes, it's a huge reason why you're not available yourself. Please hear me today. This, this is the accurate, this is the only accurate way that you can get a view of God. You'll, you'll never, ever, ever see God accurately or, or ultimately become completely and totally available unless you're spending time in God's word. If you ever want to see God clearly and ultimately become available, listening to me every week won't help you with that. It will not. Reading your Bible, getting into God's word, into his identity, into the pages in which he breathed life into is the only way for you to see him accurately and ultimately become available. I will never be responsible for changing you. And for you to think that your youth pastor here at church should be responsible for changing your kids, shame on you. To think that Sea City and their workers should be responsible for changing your kids, shame on you. You need to get in this world. Word to, to see God accurately. You will never, listen, you're cute and clever for you, all right? You will never become available to understand the will of God unless you're in the Word of God. All right, you write that down. You will never become available and understand the will of God unless you're in the Word of God, period. Check this out, just to prove the point. Verses one through three, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Isaiah, Isaiah had an accurate vision of the Lord. He didn't say in the year King Uzziah died, I got all my questions answered. Right? He didn't, he didn't get everything answered in the midst of his tragedy. That, that's important for you to understand. Okay? Because you're like, okay, the next time a crisis happens, I'm going to give God my attention. I want to see him clearly. And, and you're going to walk away because when God doesn't answer you or give you the reasons why you're going through it, you're going to get mad at God again. There is no promise that he will tell you why you're going through what you're going through. Amen, Ginge? Kidney stones? Right? She's not paying attention. She's on her Bible app updating stuff. <laughs> Seated on the throne. This is awesome. High and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Hovering over him were mighty seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with the other two they flew. In a great chorus they sang, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, and the whole earth is filled with his glory. Now take notice of the accuracy of the vision of the Lord. God was on a throne. Uzziah may have died the king of this earth, but God was still on his throne. Oh, come on. Come on. 
You may have lost a brother, a mother, a sister, a father. Your children may be running away from God as fast as they can. You may have just lost your job. You may have just foreclosed on your house. But God is still on the throne. The throne was high. And it was exalted, which means that it was greater and higher than any other throne seen. The train, just the train, it filled the temple. The train is a symbol of royalty. The train of God filled the entire temple and at his sides were angels and their job was nothing more than to give glory to God. Wow. Wow. And what do we know about angels? Here's what we know. Get precious moments out of your brains, okay? We know from Scripture that angels are not cute, chubby, and cuddly, which means they look nothing like me. We know that these angels were beings without sin, And they were powerful. How do you know that, Josh? Just go read your scriptures. Do a word search. And just about any time you see an angel speak on behalf of the Lord or on behalf of God, what do they first say? Fear not. (laughs) So if you have ever heard from an angel, right? Because in Hebrew, fear not means I'll get you some toilet paper. All right? They're powerful. They're pure. Yet they're six wings. They cover their face and their feet. Why are they doing this? Because even in their power and their purity, they were not holy enough to see God. Listen, folks, we make a grave mistake. We make a grave mistake when we try to portrait and picture in our head and imagine God's goodness is just a little bit better than the best human being that we know. We do God a grave injustice. Listen, folks, he is in a class of all his own. We can hardly even, this is the best description of who he is. And this is, this is amazing. God's purity even makes sinless, pure, and powerful angels blush. And the angels are praising him, not just once, not twice, but three times. Holy, holy, holy. And I've taught this before in scripture, but anywhere that you see a word emphasized three times in a row, it means no, 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 no. What you think of holy, not that. No. Second holy, no, 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 no. That is not as holy as you think. Holy is here. It's in a class by itself. This is a big, big deal. Which means that he and his holiness is supreme, it's divine, and it's unmatching. That's how holy it is. And the images are designed to point out the accuracy, the accuracy of who God is. And they are intended to do one thing. When you accurately see God, it is to provoke within you reverence and awe. See, when someone is reverent and they are in awe of somebody, you tend to sometimes become speechless, don't you? Wow. You tend to be kind of at that point in which I will do whatever you ask me to do. I will go wherever you tell me to go. Don't you? An accurate view of God begins, begins, listen, when we stop and we gasp in our tragedies at the wonder and the power and the otherness of God and not focus on who we are, but rather focus on who he is. I can't think of anything else that would be, that would, that would make you want to become more available than to actually see God for who he really is. And it's worth noticing here, when we develop an accurate view of who God is, it immediately, listen, it immediately reveals to us an accurate view of who we are. 
When we get an accurate view of who God is, it immediately reveals accurately to you who you are. And when we see God accurately in his identity, it immediately, it immediately reveals our identity without him. Isaiah's response is not what we would have expected here. This, this is amazing because, because in my thinking, this is like the natural thing that I would probably like see this and like, whoa, wow, right? But Isaiah is not impressed. He is not wowed. He is absolutely and unequivocally, the scripture says, undone. What does that mean? He is broken. He is one step closer to being able to pray a prayer of availability, of send me. You cannot, listen, that's why we did these in the first, the, the first three orders. You've got, to, you've got to allow God to search you, test your thoughts, and let you know everything about yourself. Then you've got to move to brokenness, and then that leads you to praying a prayer of availability. Undone. Check this out. Then I said, my destruction, this is, this is how powerful God is. I'm a dead man. I am a dead man. He said, my destruction is sealed for I am a sinful man. In another translation, it says, I am a man of unclean lips and a member of a sinful race. Yet I have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Now this means only one thing. Don't miss this. It's huge today. The first response of an unholy person to the holiness of God is an acute awareness of your sin. If you are having trouble seeing what you are doing is wrong and against God, which is called sin, you are not pursuing holiness. Because holiness reveals it. Sin conceals it. Listen, folks. If you ever desire to know who you are and to know your availability to him, you must be undone before God can make you redone. You have to be. You must become broken. Broken. The best thing. Listen, I, I mean this with all my heart. It kind of sounds bad. But the best thing that God could do for you or for any man or woman is to completely ruin your life. Huh? You know why? Because it's an awakening that it's not your life. It's his. And when he ruins you, sometimes if you allow him to redo you, then you wake up. He's got your attention. You become aware and you are one step closer to becoming available. Oh, man. Notice something else about Isaiah's conviction. Totally awesome. Totally worth pointing out. Immediately when I said the other version said that I am a, a sinful man. I am, I am a man with unclean lips. So what is he most conscious of? What's the first thing that he sees when he sees the awe and the glory of God? He becomes conscious of his unclean lips. Now think about that just for a minute. For, for Isaiah, a prophet who was the spokesperson for God, right? What, what is the most important attribute for him? His mouth. He's a prophet of God, meaning his lips. His lips, which would have been the most holy part of his body, is what, is what you would think would fare well in light of God's holiness or would fare the best. But his lips was what he saw as sinful. And this is so interesting to me because even in his greatest strength, he was undone when it was compared to God's holiness. Even in your greatest attribute, your greatest talent that God has given to you, it is unmatching to God's holiness. Wow. So that leads us to our third word today. First, he wants your attention. First, he wants your accurate view of him. And then lastly, 
He wants your freedom. No, this is not last. I'm sorry. It's number three. <laughs> he wants freedom. Did, did you know so many of us are in bondage with our life. We're, we're, we're a slave to some type of sin in our life, some type of stronghold in our life. But did you know that God actually wants you to experience freedom so badly? So badly. So badly. Watch, watch what I mean. Once Isaiah realizes his sin, right? Notice what happens. It's so cool. Then one of the seraphim flew over to the altar and he picked up a burning coal with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and he said, see, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. And when I read this, I'm prone to say, ow! Right? A burning coal touching my lips. And the angel takes this hot coal, he touches Isaiah's mouth. And what is he doing here? What exactly? He's basically cauterizing the sin in Isaiah. Medically speaking, cauterization is a process of sealing a wound or destroying any abnormal or infected tissue with a heated instrument. That is what cauterization means. So God cauterizes Isaiah's lips. He eliminates his impurity. Isaiah's guilt is taken away, but it's not shrugged off. God doesn't do this and say, all right, let's just forget about this one. Instead, he tells Isaiah this, your, your guilt is removed and your sin is forgiven. Now let's get going. Let's get going. And that's because of this promise in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17, which is kind of our key passage in next week, which is interesting because it just kind of moves right into this. But if anybody, what, is in Christ, he's a new creation. He's a new creation. And this idea is huge when it comes to your availability, friends, because if you have sin somewhere in your life, listen, if you have sin somewhere in your life, you'll never be able to pray, send me. Won't happen. You are not completely available if you are holding on to something or something's holding on to you. You are still living for you. But because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross and at the resurrection, you are free from that sin. You just need to confess it, repent of it, and believe that you're free. You become totally and completely available when you fully and finally recognize that you are a child of God, not because you are good, but because you are forgiven. All right, let's wrap it up. The fourth word. Attention, accuracy, freedom. And this is our dangerous prayer of the day. Send me, ready? Surrender. Surrender. Then, after all this has happened, after God's got his attention, right, and he's got an accurate view of who God is, and now he's found freedom in the presence of God, now he, he's, he's about ready to pray a dangerous prayer. Then I heard the Lord asking, whom should I send as a messenger to my people? Who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. When you are beginning to pursue holiness, you must know that it comes with a complete change and surrender to him. We see here that the Lord is now looking for a messenger, an Isaiah who's been transformed by the grace of God and made alive by the mercy of God, willingly volunteers for service. God says, who shall I send? And Isaiah, in all of this awareness, in all of that's happened in his life, he says, are you kidding me, God? Are you kidding me? There is nothing that I would not do for you. Here am I, send me. Here am I. R.C. Sproul, the great R.C. Sproul that just passed away this past year, pointed out what Isaiah doesn't say. I love this. He doesn't say, here I am, for that would only identify his position. Instead he says, here am I. And then he offers himself as a living sacrifice. Romans chapter 12, 1. Present your body as a living sacrifice. Holy, holy, and acceptable unto God. Which what? Which it's, your, it's the least you could do. It's the least. It's your reasonable service. I'm telling you this, friends. We see an acute awareness of who we are and who God is. Which only demands... A selfless response of, of, of availability. Please, please hear me today, all right? 
I've said this so many times, I just don't know how else to say it, but if you are a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, if you have placed a faith in Jesus Christ, you have received his grace, grace, unmerited favor. He did something for you that you could never do, and he's just being generous to give it to you. And you place a faith in him. Guys, just please hear me. The idea of an unchanged Christian or an unavailable Christian is absolutely and utterly ridiculous. It is absolutely and utterly ridiculous. If anybody is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and new has come. Oh man, we're going to get in this more next week, but just when a person understands who God is and what he's done for them, I don't know, I just don't know how total and complete surrender and your availability is not the natural byproduct. I don't get it. And we're not talking an occasional, yeah, I'll sacrifice and I'll serve every once in a while and I'll, I'll, I'll submit every once. No, no, no. In light of what he has done for you, how can you not do this every breath you breathe? This is the problem. This is the problem. Why the message of Jesus Christ, it's still moving, but it's not moving at the pace in which God would intend it to move. Holiness is not an option. Your, your availability, it is not an option. It literally demands that you pray this dangerous prayer every day of your life. Send me, send me. And if you're not praying that prayer of send me as often as you can, I'll let you do the math. Listen, friends, your identity in Christ your pursuit of holiness, your availability is not a democracy. It is a theocracy. And you will continue to struggle in your life until you completely allow God to search you, break you, and ultimately send you. So I'll stand. Jesus, I pray today. I pray today, God, that for many people that are sitting here today, this would be a life changing message. God, I pray today that someone here today truly and honestly experiences you in a way that they've never experienced you before. That maybe, just maybe, their life would change dramatically. I pray that somebody here today, God, they became acutely aware of the sin that's in their life. And Lord, I pray that that sin would drive them to you, not away from you. So they could experience your love, your mercy, and your grace. And I also pray today, God, that somebody here today might just have the courage for the first time in their life to pray a prayer of availability. Here am I. Send me. With your head still bowed, two great ways for you to respond to today's message. Once again, man, last week you did a great job. All heads are still bowed and eyes are closed. But we had, we had several people sign up. We, we went from 70 to like 107 to the prayer team. It is so simple. And that, that's honestly, if you were to sign up for the prayer team, all you're doing is taking a step 
towards being available and used by God. Today is a great time to do that. At the front, there's cards that you can simply, you grab two so you know what your responsibilities are. They're not hard at all. And then put your name, your phone, and your email and drop it in the baskets at the front, please. We're our, we just got, we got a new goal. It was 100. Now we're going 125 by the end of this month. If you're out there and you're not a, prayer, a part of this prayer team, come on, come on. What's wrong with you? Seriously. Run your tail up to the front today and sign this card. Ridiculous. Don't be afraid to pray. How can you ever get to know somebody better if you won't talk to them? Come on. And last, I just want to challenge you. I want to challenge you today. If you're out there and something has just hit you like it's never hit you before. And you're ready today. You are ready today to pray a prayer of availability that says, send me. You have asked God to search you. You have asked God to break you. Today is the day to pray that prayer of availability. Now, here's the deal. Again, I'm going to do this. I'm going to meet you in the front. I'm going to meet you halfway. And if I come down here and somebody out there that you're white knuckling it and you're scared to death right now because you don't want to move because you're afraid of what everybody else around you is thinking, shame on you. Don't do that. Don't let your pride get in the way. Pride is probably one of the number one lines of defense against, against holiness. Get it out of the way. And if God is moving in your life, to come forward today and say, I am available. Send me. You meet me at the front and we'll pray with you today that prayer. And maybe today, maybe today somebody's out there and you're ready to pray the prayer of this. I'm tired, God. I'm tired of doing it my way. My way is hard. It's difficult. It's wearing me out. It's beating me down. I'm done, God. I am done. You have searched me. You have now broken me, and God, now I am available to become a child of God. Today, it's simple, man. It's simple. Admit that you're a sinner. Become aware that you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus Christ paid a debt for you that you could not pay by giving you grace. And commit your life to him. Today is the day of salvation. I'm going to encourage you too. I'm going to be in the front, and I'm going to encourage you to come forward and meet me as well. Now, here's the deal. As soon as I say, let's do it, I want you to do it. All right, some, some of you, I've kind of been talking with my wife. She's like, they just need to be told what to do. So I'm telling you what to do. It's simple. Maybe you're out there and you're a husband or you're a wife and, 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 and the other person is just not doing it. You grab them by the hand and you say, let's go. Let's do this thing. We're going to sing a song. I'm coming down to the front. If I walk out here in this first service and no one comes forward, I'm going to be ticked. All right? Let's do it right now. Let's do it.